All right, so let's talk about function notation, transformations, and domain range. Um, so this is going to be kind of our introduction to all function notation and all transformations. Um, basically, we're going to be talking about this stuff till May. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a general day so we don't have to teach the same stuff eight times. And so you don't have to learn the same stuff eight times. So let's talk about this. Now, I want to use the metaphor of modifying a car because I'm a little bit familiar with this. So if you took your favorite Honda Civic and you added a new engine, new wheels, and lowered it, um, you would have essentially a very different looking car. So your new Civic is basically that old Civic plus an engine plus four wheels minus a little bit of suspension travel. And that's essentially what we do when we talk about modifying a function. Um, now, we have different types of transformations. We don't, obviously we're not changing a suspension or engine. We're going to be talking about shifted, stretched, compressed, or reflected. And these transformations follow a similar pattern for all these function types. Linear, absolute value, quadratic, square root, cubic, cube root, exponential, logarithm, rational, Basically everything. You can even use this with functions that we're not even talking about in this class or combination of functions. But how we write these transformations is we write them through something called function notation. So we have been writing functions like f of x, right? And what that means is we're just saying function f uses variable x. And x is what we're plugging into it. Now we could use any a f or a thing on the outside. So we could use g and we can say we're plugging in variable z. Yeah, we typically don't do that because we're not plugging in variable z. Um, but you probably have seen g of x or h of x or k of x. Those letters in front are just ways of identifying this is this function. So how do we modify something? Well, we could say that, hey, we're gonna make a new function g of x, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna take f of x, we're gonna add two to everything. And that's called a transformation. Now, wherever we're modifying the original one, we call the parent function. Because it spawns, it produces children. You get the metaphor, even if you don't like it. So um, let's talk about what these transformations look like. Um, we can have a stretch or compression, which is essentially changing the size of it. So we can stretch or compress vertically or stretch or compress horizontally. So this would be a vertical one. Let me write a little bit more permanently. That's just pitiful writing. Let me do this, your entire screen. No, I hit the wrong button. There we go. All right, cool. Now I can write and y'all can read it. So this is vertical. This is going up and down. That's vertical stuff. And then we can also have horizontal. This is going left, right, or in or out. It's going horizontal, vertical, okay? Then we can also have shifts. Shifts are just movements, uh, moving up, down, left, right. So if we have vertical, that's up and down. If we have horizontal, that's left and right. Um, and then we can also have reflections. This is flipping something. So if I take here, let's use a very light up mouse. Here is my function. If I'm flipping it vertically, I am essentially rotating it. So I'm going from this, you want to bring it a little closer, it's easier to see. So if I'm going flipping it vertically, I'm going from like this, to like this. With this point still staying the same, I'm just essentially rotating it. Or if I was flipping it horizontally, I'm keeping the same angle, I'm just flipping it like that. Now, for our purposes, horizontal reflections, those are going to be over the y-axis. So this is, this is our horizontal reflections. And then over the x-axis, is our vertical. I know my face cut off the horizontal, but it's there. I see 
See, it's right above me. Cool. Okay. Um, let's fix that real quick. Cool. All right. So let's go on with that. Now, I do want to say, uh, just as a side note here, if you're in L and you're watching this video, horizontal stretches and reflections, this thing, this is K only. So, excuse me, if you're in K and trying to help an L student and you're like, there's no, there's no B value, there's, there's nothing on the inside here. Yeah, that's, that's intentional. So let's talk about what this might look like, for example. So if I took um, G of X and I wanted to shift things, um, our shifts are over here, okay? So these are movements. So if I said, hey, I want to take F of X, I want to move it up or I want to move it down, then what I'm doing is I'm essentially adding or subtracting at the end of the function. If I wanted to move it left or right, that would be adding or subtracting on the inside. Okay. Um, if I wanted to stretch or compress something, so if I wanted to make it bigger or smaller or anything there, if I'm doing vertical ones, I'm multiplying on the outside. If I'm stretching or compressing on the inside, that uh, is horizontal changes. Um, and then finally, let's talk about reflections. Um, so reflections are negative signs, basically. Negative on the outside is a vertical reflection. Negative on the inside is a horizontal. So I think the easiest way to show this is let me kick out of here. I'm going to exit what we have here. Let's see. I can pull up my apps. Let's grab Desmos. Cool. And let's see if we can kind of show some of this. So I'm going to make a fairly interesting function here. I'm going to say that I have f of x equals Let's do a square root function because this is easier to see. So there, there's a function there. I'm going to say that g of x equals f of x. Oops. Okay. And let's make this a little bit easier to tell. So I'm going to make this a dashed line. I'm going to make it uh, a little bit more bold. Let's make it five. You can kind of see right now they're on top of each other. But if I make changes to this, it would change it appropriately. So we first talked about shifting up and down. So if I did like plus three, that moved up. If I do a minus, that's moving it down. You can kind of see it's the same shape, just way up and down. Or I can add or subtract on the inside. So let's do a plus three on the inside. Well, that moved it left. Left, your left. My right, your left. Anyway, that moved it left. And the, the interesting thing about that is we're adding to it, but it's getting more negative. Well, why is that? Why is that everything on the inside backwards? Because if we subtract from it, we'll move it more positive side. We'll move it more to the right right side. Um, the reason for this is we're changing what goes into the function. Think of it this way. If I tell you that you have a 10 point bonus on a test, what do you need to score to get 100 on that test? You only need a 90. So if I'm adding to what's going in, you can get a lower score. If I said no, no, I'm... Um, I'm punishing you somehow. I'm going to take 10 points off of your test grade. Now you need 110 to get that perfect score. Now, side note, that would never happen. That's not cool. But you get my point is that these adding and subtracting are kind of working backwards because they're changing what's going in. So that's what's going on there. So now let's talk about stretches and compressions. Okay. Let's do this. Um, if I multiply on the outside with a number that's bigger than one, let's say five, that stretched it. It went from here, or it went from like, yeah, okay, I'm curving the wrong way. Went from like here to like here. 
it stretched it and moved it more up. First, if I do a small number, let's make it 0.2. You see how I went from here down, got lower? That's a compression, vertical compression. What if we do the same thing on the inside? So if I'm going to put this here, now it looks like it got bigger. Let's see what's actually going on. If we're talking horizontally, if we're talking horizontally, really what's going on here is horizontally shoving it closer. It's going more towards, let me grab a mouse real quick so you can kind of see what I'm looking at here. Ah, there we go. It's going more towards this side. So a point that was over here, now over here, went towards this center line, went towards the y-axis. It's being horizontally compressed. Um, an easier graph to show this with is let me do a quadratic. So you can see the original line, now it's being shoved in. So this is a horizontal compression. Um, versus if I do a number that's small in here, that's expansion, horizontally. Sometimes these are harder to see. Um, and it kind of is this weird thing where if I have a very simple graph, a straight line, well, is this being horizontally stretched or is it being vertically compressed? It's kind of hard to tell because all that really went is we went from an angle like this to an angle like this. Well, hard to tell. What if we make this thing really interesting? Ooh, now we can tell. Now we can go, look at how the red line, the default, so here's our default, goes like this, but suddenly, the blue line's like slowly going back and forth. It's not any taller, but it's, just, it's slower, right? That's definitely horizontally stretched. Whereas if I put a five here, it's compressed. We took that spring and went yik. Versus if we put numbers out front, it's doing the same pattern. Like we have the peaks in the same place. They're just bigger peaks. Or if I do something smaller, one half. Peaks are in the same place, they're smaller peaks. That's the difference between horizontally, or horizontal, vertical, stretch, compression, all that stuff. Okay, now let's talk about reflections. Um, I'm gonna go back to that square root function, SQRT. Cool, back to our thing. Let's reflect it on the outside. So let's put a negative sign in front. And it flipped down. It flipped over the x-axis. It's a vertical flip. What if we put a negative here? It's a horizontal flip. And what if we did both? Well, it's vertical and negative. Vertical and horizontal. So we went, okay, flip over this, flip over this, go in this way. Notice how it still starts from the same point. We didn't move anything. Just like with stretches or compressions. So if I put a stretch on this, I'm still starting from the same point. I'm still starting from zero, zero. If I put a compression on it, still starting from zero, zero. Horizontal uh, stretch on it. Or compression, still starting from zero, zero. But I am changing how it flipped. Now, sometimes that's harder to tell. Let's take something like this. Now if I reflect it vertically, it's easy to tell. But if I reflect it horizontally, eh, doesn't really matter. There, there's cases where it does, but in this case it doesn't. The reason being is this side of the graph is the same as this side of the graph. So that's where what we're trying to do today is we're trying to just show you in general, this is how this stuff works, so that we can give you more complicated problems complicated functions you go yeah I know how this stuff works because they all work the same it doesn't matter I can put any function we want into here let's do something weird let's do tangent of x that's pretty weird squared that's really weird all right so let's do this I'm going to take that entire thing I'm going to put a minus two on the end shifts the whole thing down doesn't matter what we're doing Okay, mm. 
what about if okay uh tangent of x square is a little bit on the weird side because there's some rules about what you can do and can't do with tangent but i want to just show you minus three moves it to the right plus one on the inside moves it left um if we put a negative out front it reflects the entire thing if we put a negative on the inside it does absolutely nothing because it's symmetrical um so all of our rules they all work what about a vertical stretch okay a big vertical stretch it does work or a horizontal compression it works so like all our rules still apply even though we have this insane function let me make this a bit more normal so yeah that's that's what we're doing here um now just to kind of talk more about this let me flip this thing back into more normal stuff and let's talk about how how we can take this and actually turn this into some transformation um so what if we told you hey uh we have this parent function into this so i can zoom in a little bit we have this parent function we said it, we want to shift it right and reflect it over the x-axis what would be our function notation well let's first talk about the transformations so if we're shifting right and reflecting over the x-axis let's pick a few points so i'm going to pick this point here because that seems like a key point here i'm going to shift it right four so i go one two three four here's my new point if i reflect over the x-axis i'm on the x-axis doesn't really matter let's do the same thing here point here one two three four well i'm reflecting it so it's now down here okay what about let's grab another point grab this point one two three four but i'm going to reflect it so it's now down here so if i connect my dots I would have a new graph and if I did that for everything like if I did this point move it four over would be one two three four reflect it so instead of four up it's four down would be down here same thing with the other point I'd have a point down here so you can see how if we connect the dots we're starting to get the same shape just reflected and following all this now what what would this new function look like well we'd say it's g of x is our new function we're taking it from f of x so what's our changes well we have the shift right four shifting right means that we're going to have a minus sign on the inside let's do that let's say minus four and then we also have a reflect over the x-axis Reflecting over the x-axis is this thing. So we'll do this. So we'll have a negative sign out in front. And that would do exactly what it says. So let's try another one. What if we give you the function notation? Well, what you can essentially do with that is you can kind of plug things in. So check this out. I'm going to grab a random point here. All right, so this point, actually, let's do this point because this point's a little bit interesting. This is 2, 1. So I'm going to plug this in to what we have. Now, what we're seeing here is we see a 2 in front, so that is a vertical stretch. We see a horizontal reflection. We see a plus two, so that's a shift left. And we see a plus three, and that's a shift up. Okay. So let's do this first. We have this general shape. We kind of have a point here, point here, point here. And if we connect the dots, we should be good. So let's take that shape. And what we're going to do is let's first do our vertical stretch so if i stretched it that's going to take my y value and that's going to multiply it right 
So if I multiplied, well, my y value here is zero. So that's not gonna change anything. So my new y value is also zero. Y value here is three. So if I'm multiplying it by two, new y value is six. My y value here is one. Multiply that by two is two. My new y value here, well that's four. So two times four is eight. So it'd be up here. I'm connecting the dots. We have that. All right. Well, what about the next thing is we have this negative in front, this horizontal reflection. So what that's essentially going to do, is that's going to take this and flip it. So do I have a resize option? That doesn't help me. Okay. So what that would essentially do, I'm gonna just do it here, is you see how my Y value, or my X value is negative three. Well, that means it's now positive three. My X value is zero, so it's still zero. My X value is two here, so it would now be negative two. My X value is five, so it would be negative five. Cool, so let's connect the dots on that. Two. Okay, now it's just a matter of, let's get rid of the old lines. We don't really need those anymore. And now we have the shifts. We're gonna take what we wrote, and get rid of this blue line so I don't accidentally grab it. This is more of just for practical purposes. And let's grab this. I'm gonna take this. And we need to shift it left two. And we need to shift it up three. We now have a new line. So that's essentially what we're doing. Now this one was really complicated. We have four transformations here. And for most of our purposes, we'll see what those transformations are and we can kind of make more judgment calls based on that. This is also a more complicated line than you typically would have. Like where we're going is absolute values. This is what an absolute value looks like. It's, it's not nearly as complicated. I just wanted to show you, you can do it, even with something really complicated and you don't know the function type, okay? So this is more of how we would go about this, is we may show you a graph and say, all right, What's the transformations? What does the function notation look like? Domain range. So let's do this. Um, for the first one, we're gonna say that our dashed lines are our parent function, or our solid lines are our new function. And here's how we would go about this. Oh, we haven't talked about domain range yet. So let's, let's not worry about domain and range right now. We'll get there. Let's talk about just transformations and function notation. So here's why we do. I would look for key points. Like I see that this is the lowest point and this is the lowest point here. We're going this way. So we went right one and down three. So I'd say shift right one, shift down three. And then let's look and see how these points, let's grab another point and just kind of see how it's looking. So I see that I can go up one and over one to get this point here. Let's see if we can do that on the green function. So can I go up one and over one and end up on the function? Yes, I can. So that probably means I haven't changed the shape of it at all. Just to show you what I mean by that, let's look at the one next to it. This one obviously, went down, but it's more than that, right? The original one's opening up, this one's opening down. So what's going on here? Well, we probably reflect it. Let's see what happens if we just put a reflection in. This thing is starting at negative one, one. This point down here is negative one, negative one. 
It's literally just a reflection for that point. Okay. So we're definitely reflecting. And since we reflected this way, we're reflecting over the x-axis. Because that's what that is. Okay. Well, what else is happening here? Let's grab another point. Now, another point on this line is up one and over one. Well, we're reflecting, so we wouldn't expect that to work. But we might expect down one and over one to work. That's not working. What is working is the next point is down two and over one. This became twice as big. It vertically stretched. So we have a vertical stretch of two. That's what's going on here. Okay? So that's what we're seeing. The change looking like this. Now, as far as our function notation, let's let's write the, for these two things. Let's say that our original function, let's call it here, our original function's f of x, and our new function's g of x. We'll do the same thing here. This is f of x, this is g of x. Okay. So our function notation would be our new function, g of x, equals f of x, but if I'm shifting right, I would do minus on the inside, so minus one, so I went right one, and shifted down three, so minus three on the outside. Same thing with the next one. Um, g of x equals f of x. I have a reflection over the x-axis. So I'm going to say, all right, I have a negative sign out front. I have a vertical stretch of two. Okay, well, that means that I need a two also in front. Now, how can you tell if it's a vertical stretch or horizontal compression or any of those things? Because those are sometimes hard to see. We never go for horizontal stretches or compressions from a graph. So just do not worry about those at all. Um, so yeah, that, that's really what we're doing for these things. Now, let's talk domain range. Domain range is just a way of talking about the possible values for a particular graph. Um, for all the x values, all the y values. So like on this particular one, our lowest x value is negative two, because here's the lowest x value. Highest one is positive four. Here's the highest x value. Our lowest y value is negative three. Our highest one's positive four. If you look what happens if I connect these, this is a box around the entire function. Is essentially saying, hey, everything of function, our function stuff's in here. That's essentially what we're saying. Now we can write domain range in a couple of different ways. Um, to show that, let me show you here. We can write in inequality, which looks like where we just say, all right, is between these two inequalities. We can say that set builder. Set builder is basically inequality, but we define our variable first. Then we also talk about interval notation. Now, interval notation basically says we put parentheses if it does not equal. We put a bracket if it does equal. So in the case of our prior problem, we could write them with our interval notation. That's right. Or sorry, that's our inequality notation. We could do basically the same thing. With set builder, it's just that we have this dash x in front, or we could do interval. Now it equals both negative two and four for x. Like we have points that actually touch these lines. Not every graph does that. If it doesn't touch those lines, then we put parentheses. Let's not worry about that too much for right now. That's going to be a future us problem, like way future us problem, like spring. Um, but yeah, just, just so that we're doing things right. That's why we're doing certain things. For our purposes, we're pretty much going to just say bracket. So how would this look in interval and set builder? Well, this thing keeps going. So if I tried to put a box around it, it's going to break right through my box. And it keeps going on both sides. So this is keep going here, keep going here. So really, 
our domain and range are going to be all real numbers. Now, we can write that all real numbers. All real numbers. We can put, um, we can also put it as negative infinity. Let's, let's write it here like this. We can also put it as negative infinity less than x is less than infinity. That might be another way to say it. And we can do the same thing with y. There's also a symbol um, for all real numbers that looks like an r but with two lines. That would be another way. And then also for interval, we can essentially represent it like this. Negative infinity to positive infinity. That's everything. So that is all real numbers, because yes, there are fake ones. You know who you are. No, seriously, we'll, we'll teach you imaginary numbers later. Um, but let's oh, 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 that was loud. Hold on. And we're back. The threat of someone walking their dog in front of our house has been, has been dealt with. Okay. In all seriousness, let's look at this one. This one's a little bit more straightforward because this is our lowest number. This is our highest number for x. So really, we're from negative 9 to negative 1. Because that's the lowest, that's the highest. For our range, our lowest y value is negative 1. Our highest is 7. And we're dealing with y. Um, we can also write as an interval. Also, I should put lines underneath these because we can equal those. Um, our interval here would be from negative infinity to positive. Sorry, no, that is completely wrong. Our interval would be from negative 9 to negative 1. Our interval here would be from negative 1 to 7. And also brackets, because we can equal them. Set builders basically the same thing as a equal. Um, now, uh, for this one, it's starting from a point. We are starting from here. We're going this way. So based on that, our domain is starting at negative 3, but it's going to an inequality. So how could we write that? We could say negative 3 is less than x is less than infinity. But we really don't need to say less than infinity because everything is less than infinity. So we can write it just like that. We can also flip it and say x is greater than negative 3. Both would be true. Our y's, well, they start at negative 1, but they go to infinity. Again, we don't have to write that, so we can just say y is greater than negative 1. Both work. For our interval, we're going from negative 3 to positive infinity. And the order does matter. We always write low to high. I've been doing that this whole time. I should have noted that. Um, same thing with our range is from negative 1 to positive infinity. Also, these are or equal to, because we do have a point here. I should have included that. So that is it for this. Hopefully this is making some sense. Um, I know this is a long lesson, so I appreciate you sticking around for it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. This is something new we're trying. We'll see if it works. So. Have a good one, y'all. Hope this helps.